people throughout the world that have interesting stories to tell. Stories of heroism, acts of kindness, near-death experiences, successes, and failures. You usually hear of these stories from people that live in another state or country. But what about the stories from within your own community? Everyone has a story to tell. And by everyone, we mean your neighbor, your coworker, the person behind you at church, people you interact with on a daily basis, or maybe even you. Welcome to the DTV Podcast, presented by the Bless Your Heart Nonprofit Corporation. I'm Brennan Mathern, and I'll be your host as we speak to some of the most interesting people on Bayou Lafouche. In 2019, Lafouche Parish elected its youngest parish president. In January of 2020, at the age of 34, Archie Chasson III was sworn in as Lafouche Parish president, and he looked forward to leading Lafouche Parish into a new era. What he didn't know was there would be unprecedented times right around the corner. Two months after being sworn into office, COVID-19 arrived in Lafouche Parish, resulting in a shutdown of nearly everything. A few weeks later, a severe storm capsized the Seacorp power, which had just departed from Port Fouchon, resulting in a tragic disaster just off our coast. Then followed one of the busiest storm seasons on record, with Lafouche Parish being in the forecast cone eight times, only to be eclipsed by Hurricane Ida in 2021, the worst hurricane to hit Lafouche Parish since Hurricane Betsy in 1965. Yet despite all the adversity, President Chasso has remained steadfast in his leadership role. He has met every challenge head-on and done it with what is arguably an unprecedented level of transparency in parish government. And that's why I'm not shocked at all that he agreed to join us for this episode of the DTV Podcast. President Archie Chasson, welcome and thanks for joining us. Thanks, Brennan. Good to be with you guys. You know, Archie, I remember uh, when Garrett Graves decided he was going to run for his congressional seat. I told him, man, after all this work, after all these years, you finally decide to run for public office only to find out that one of your opponents is Edwin Edwards. (laughs) So I guess I could almost ask you the same thing. In your wildest imagination, could you have ever envisioned anything like your first two years of office? Absolutely not, Brennan. I I will tell you, when when we took office— and, and, and I say we a lot because we have a we have a great team that, that sure. helps lead the place, right? I, I would have never imagined we'd have a global pandemic, right? We were ready for the hurricanes or, or some semblance of a, a severe weather event, but but nobody ever thought we would have a global pandemic that would shut down our families, our economy, uh, every facet of our life within the first seventy four days. And look, we'll, we'll get into all those topics. We'll certainly talk about Hurricane Ida, and and we'll look uh, at towards the end of this podcast at, of the future of Lafouche Parish and where do we go from here. Uh, that was one of the things that you keyed in on. I, I mean, almost immediately after the storm hit, about you know we are going to build back and we're going to be better than we were before. Um, so, but but before we get into all that, let's talk about you as a person, uh, like we do with every other show. Let's talk about who's your mom and dad. Who's, talk about your family. Talk about where you grew up and where you went to school. Yeah, so I, f- I freak a lot of people out because. People read my biography on the on the website, and it says it says I'm a native of Colorado Springs, Colorado. Uh, my dad it was a was an Army veteran. He was a helicopter pilot, and he was stationed up there. Uh, so I am. I was born at probably one of the only Army brats that was born at an Air Force hospital. But apparently, my mom liked the paint color better, so that's what we did. <laughs> um, but I, I was born up there. My dad retired about seven or eight months after I was born, and, and we came back down here. Fifth generation Lafouchian. My, my grandparents and everybody's from from the area. Uh, worked in the oil and gas industry. Um, I'm the third, of course, so my dad's going to be Archie Jr. My mother is uh, originally a champagne from the central part of the parish, and my claim to fame is that my great grandparent, uh, my great grandfather, and his brothers and sisters had the Raceland Rambler band back in the day. <laughs> um, so that, that's our one claim to fame. But grew up in Lockport, um, had a great childhood there through the public school system. Graduated from Central, uh, which I know is tough for you as a tarpon uh. to, to sit across. But uh, graduated from Central Lafouche, and then you know went, went on to Nichols to do some great things there. Well, and, and that's where uh, our stories meet up at, at some point because we did both uh, graduate from Nickel State University. And, and let's talk about that for a minute. Um, obviously, you attended there and and now – and really since you left there, you've remained uh, busy and, and involved with that university. Uh, you've been part of the alumni board. You've been president a couple of times. Talk about uh, your involvement uh, during and, and post Nichols and, and why you feel it's so important to stay involved with where you went to school. Yeah, I got involved in, in student government when I was at Nichols in, in SGA and uh, kind of did that for a little bit and got out. Um, you know, probably spent more time skipping class at the Nichols Farm than I did actually in class a lot of times, uh, but was actually able to graduate with a positive GPA, which was a plus. Um, but, you know, as you as you grow, you, you, you learn to 
to give back to what you got, right? Uh, did a lot of cool things, met a lot of cool people at Nichols, um, people we still talk to today, like like yourself, uh, but but walked away from it. Didn't really do a whole lot of social activities on campus, right? Never really went to the football games, never really did any sporting events, played around in the agriculture club and, and spent a lot of time, like I said, at the farm and, and worked there for a little bit. But then once you got out, you realized not only what you kind of missed there, um, but trying to figure out how to how to give back to the community and, and a place that once you grow up a little bit, realized gave you so much. So, you know, talk to, to Raz, who was the the alumni director there for probably almost four decades and uh, was able to get on, in, involved in the board. And I was probably the youngest guy on the or kid on the board at that point. You had the likes of Stephen Pelche and Tommy Eshte and uh, Miss Stella Lasang, kind of real pillars of, of our community when you look at it. Um, and then slowly just worked, worked through the board, stayed around long enough, made, um, made some positive impacts to programs and scholarships and things they were doing there. Got on the executive board and uh, Paula Rome and I have kind of the longest serving tenure of president, past president, sitting president, president elect. We went through some term changeovers where we went from one year terms to two year terms. And uh, we hung around for a while and, and finally rolled off the board about a year and a half or two years ago. But it was a great experience and still involved in there today. Right. I, I've chaired their golf tournament now since 2014 and um, continue to do so with great, great investments back into scholarships from that golf tournament. And it really is a cool university, right? We finally have sporting teams that are doing really well again, which is a, a positive thing. Uh, but just what Nichols is doing with adaptations to workforce development, uh, the new coastal center that's coming to campus, uh, and then things like the John Falls Culinary Institute and pumping out world-class chefs that go all over the world that we can tie back to Lafouche Parish is just a really, a really positive thing. And I think you hit the nail on the head. I think when we went to Nichols, it's it's missing so many of the things that are there today and, and really what's making it popular. And, and that campus life is something that we really didn't celebrate back when we were there. And now it is being. I think having, like you said, there has been a shift on the alumni board. And now that there's much more youth there, uh, you know, 40 and under. And I think having that influence of people that had basically just gone through college and realized, hey, look, it would be really cool if we had this. Uh, for the future generations, I think that that's been helpful for them. Yeah, no doubt. And and to see people who stuck with us through the Stubbs years when we went 0-11 for yeah. a season or two in, in, in football, and now that Coach, Coach Rebo's there. And, you know, athletics is awesome, but the focus that Dr. Kloon and, and the VPs have on academics uh, and changing the way that university is looking from a – from a not only an outward appearance, the, the, the improvements they've made to campus, but also what's happening internally is just really cool to be a part of. So, or, so after college, Archie, you started off in the uh, the private sector, like like many people that end up in the public sector do. Uh, talk a little bit about your experience there and what led you into the public sector. Yeah, so I, I was really lucky. Um, came out of Nichols, uh, Ashley and my, my fiance at the time. We were really getting ready to get married and kind of looking for that first big boy job, right? Um, saw an ad in the paper that, that, that Joe Pisciola was looking for, for somebody to do a little bit of grant work. And uh, Joe took a chance on a 23-year-old kid uh, from Lockport, right, that he didn't know from Adam. Um, and that, that morphed into a lot of cool things, right? The, Joe's firm does a lot of local government work, does a lot of work for the parish, does a lot of work for the Port Commission, the Levy District, um, and, and really got to intermingle in that group. Um, we did a lot of cool things for clients, and that little bit of grant writing morphed into um, – a coastal use permitting world, right? Which is something that he kind of did part time in the firm, but um, we kind of exploded that. The coastal permits were becoming a big issue. Coastal was becoming um, sexy again to 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 a certain extent. The state's master plan was starting to come out, uh, but really got to really got to meet Miss Randolph um, at that point. Uh, I'd known her a little bit when I was in college, but really got to work with her and her staff at the parish. Really got to work with Wendell down at the, the Levy District and, and then Ted Falgu and Chet over at the port. Uh, Chet had just kind of started working at the port about the same time I were, started working for Joe. And that's how it kind of morphed into that. Um, you, you got to meet these people, got to work with them. Uh, and, and one day I, I, we did a lot of work for the parish in the coastal world with your brother. Um, and we always joked about one day if he ever left, I'd love to have his job, mainly because I thought he really didn't do anything all day in the, in the coastal <laughs> world, right? Uh, and he, he still doesn't do anything all day. <laughs> yeah, right? Um, and then one day he called and said, look, I'm, I'm leaving to go to work uh, for Terrebonne Parish, and um, the job's going to be open if you want to make a swing at it. And, and that's what happened. Um, put in an application and, and sat down with Ms. Randolph and interviewed for the, the coastal zone administrator job with the parish. Um, it was right after BP happened. 
So the initial cleanup of the spill was done, but we were really focusing on things like coastal restoration. Uh, then Senator Mary Landrew had what, what we know now as the Restore Act, which is how all those BP fines were going to be divvied out and, and how we were going to spend those dollars. Um, got to travel to D.C. was actually the first time I'd ever flown on an airplane, a big airplane, believe it or not, um, in 2011 when, when Ms. Randolph and I got to go to D.C. and, and work with uh, then Senator Landrew and, and, and some other colleagues on, on that bill. And then I, I never forget it. I love to tell this story. I had, had a meeting with Charlotte, and we were we had wrapped up a, a coastal discussion. And if you've ever been in the parish president's office in Matthews, it's in a little nook, right? It's in this crevice corner. It's got like a little outer lobby with a desk where you know the secretary could sit if they really wanted to. And then there's the doorway, and then the parish president's office. And uh, we wrapped up, and I was getting ready to walk out, and she says, "Close the door." So me being a young idiot, right, I'm thinking, I'm going to walk out and close the door. And she goes, no, Goofy, with you on the inside. And I was like, oh, geez, I'm, I'm either about to get fired or, or, or something weird's about to happen. And it was right before, it was the week before Christmas of, of 2012, and the charter had been changed. There was some political things going on. The, the parish administrator had to live in Lafourche, and the current one didn't. Um, and she said, Archie, I, I want you to be the parish administrator. Uh, and I went, oh, oh geez, what, what the heck am I going to, like, how do I answer this, right? Yeah, it's going to be really awesome, but... I'm 26. Can I really can I really run a hundred million dollar corporation with 300 employees at that point? I, I, and I, so we went home, you know, talked to Ashley, prayed about it, um, and then went back after Christmas and said, "Yeah, let's give it a go, right? If it doesn't work, I'll go back to CZM. No harm, no foul. I'll try not to make you look bad, and we'll, we'll probably be a month long process, right? Um, and it and it lasted. I did that from uh, 2013 to to 2015 when she got out of office after that reelection bid um, didn't go so well. Um, and then made that transition over to working for Mayor Eshday with the city of Thibodeau. And it was kind of one of those similar conversations. Tommy picked up the phone one day during the campaign and said, um, look, you know, my public works director is retiring. If, if this reelection bid doesn't go well for, for Charlotte and, and you need somewhere to land on your feet, why don't we sit down and have a conversation? Um, and spent four great years with, with Mayor Eshday. And, and that transition was a little bit different because it's, while all politics are local, you go from a parish that has 97,000 people and is 1,500 square miles to a city that is six square miles. Politics gets real local real quick, right? Because they expect that I called and I got a pothole on Menard Street. You better be there 15 minutes later filling that pothole. It's, it's right. not really like that in parish government. But Tommy was a joy to work for. I learned a lot of great things from, from him while I was there from an administrative standpoint, how to talk to people, how to deal with people. I learned a lot from Ms. Randolph when, when I worked for her for those five years as well. Um, and ways to work in D.C. and work through that bureaucracy uh, and still bring stuff back home, but keeping a focus on, on what we do here locally. So you you had a chance, you kind of dipped your toes in with parish administrator and you got to taste it. And basically, for those that aren't aware, parish administrator is right below the parish president. You're basically their, their number two person. Uh, or you're the number one besides the parish president. And so you're actually the supervisor of every parish employee. So, but... That being said, that is a big jump from that seat to the seat <laughs> on top of that with parish president. So how do you how do and, and again at the time that you ran uh, you know prior to running you were DPW at Thibodeau at the city of Thibodeau. How do you make the jump from public servant to politician to run for office uh, and and put your name out there? Now it's your name on all the signs. Yeah, it 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 was it was a lot of hard thinking and and look. You know, after after Mr. Randolph lost that reelection bid in, in 2015, and President Cantrell came in, you know, your phone really starts ringing, right? Um, and people are like, "Okay, even though he just won, we kind of all know where this is going to end up." Um, and and are you really going to consider doing this? And you know, at that point, you're like, "Look, I just landed this cool job with the city. I'm 30. I got a two year old and a and a year old little girl, right? I'm just beginning this family." Ash and I are still young. I'm like, guys, I, I don't know what that's going to look like. Let's let's figure it out. Um, and then as the years go by working for the city of Thibodeau, that, that, that calling becomes stronger, not only from the public, but but within, right? It was it was the right time. Um, I, I think when, just as we mentioned with the alumni board, that younger group came in. We've seen across the country a, a, a younger movement of people come in. You know, it just felt like the right time to do it. it. It felt like God had put us in a position where if we were going to do it, now was the time to do it from a spiritual standpoint. Um, the, the, the backers were there because, let's face it, we don't, run a, we don't run elections without people giving you money. 
um, unless you're independently wealthy, which I am not. Um, so you had to have a, a backer component there. Um, but it, but it was tough, you know, to, to go from, we don't come from a political family. You know, my, my mom has worked for the same optometrist for almost 40 years. Uh, my dad worked for state government for a while at, at, as the executive director for the freshwater district. Uh, but he came from a biology background, right? He was a, a driller offshore for, for a while, uh, worked for an environmental company when, when I was really young and then did this. And then he went, he, he kind of retired out as he, as he got older. We didn't come from a, a, a blue blood political family. We didn't come from people who dabbled in politics. I was the first Guillaume of, of my family to think about doing this, right? Um, so it was it was tough to, to think about how to do this. But again, it felt like the right time. It, it felt like God was calling us to do this. And, and lo and behold, we, we go ahead and we win the damn election. Um, which at, at the time, and, and I'm, I'm, you know, people, people love to talk about polls and politics. And uh, we ran the first poll in the summer of 2018, maybe. Um, and you, you would think, and, and even I thought, right, selfishly, I was the, the number two guy in parish government. I've worked in the city of Thibodeau. I've done the alumni board thing. At one point, I, I served on the, the board of the chamber for a lot of years, was the chairman of the chamber board um, back in 2013. People know who Archie is, right? And you run this poll and you realize that the average Joe down West 123rd has no clue who the heck you are. Uh, and, and the name recognition number in that poll number was 12%. And I'm going, there's, there's no way, guys. There's no way I'm winning this election. Um, but we, we, ran, we ran a campaign on not making promises, not being a typical politician, saying what we thought, even though it may not have been popular, um, and talked about what we were going to do, not saying, yep, I'm going to fix your pothole or I'm going to install your culvert, like so many other politicians in this parish have done for over the years. And it resonated with a whole jump load of people. Um, and we were really lucky, you know, we got some, some a big state, big state coverage with WDSU does a hot seat kind of debate. Um, and that's what threw us over the, 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 the level, right? We had done some local debates and it kind of, it, it helps, but it's such a small audience. You run a, a debate after a Saints game on a Sunday afternoon, people watch that stuff. And it was right after early voting and it, it made the difference. And I truly think that along with just the, the campaign strategy that the team put together, it, it worked. So I have to ask this question. Back in 2003, when, when Charlotte, you, you, um, who hired you, when she ran for her first time, for her first uh, run at the parish president seat, she announced in February of the year of the election. And everybody said, oh, man, that's early. And it, you know, even still to this day, uh, most, most people running for office will announce uh, about six months or so before an election. You basically put your name out there a full year and and there's there's a lot of different you know uh, reason rhyme and reason but the one i kept hearing is man you just have to do less if you announce closer <laughs> to the election so i have to ask this question after nearly a full year of campaigning did you have that moment where you felt like okay we accomplished the goal but we were just getting started like was it was there that realization that Oh man, we won, but now is when the job really starts. Yeah, you know, we when we made the campaign announcement. If anybody ever calls me or you run into me on the street, you say, "Hey, Arch, how's it going?" My my number one answer is always, "I'm living the dream," right? So the day we announced the campaign, I used that that this was the day that had culminated my life basically to this point, right? And I was living the dream. We announced we were running for office, and the day we walked into the polls to go vote. Um, in the runoff election, I'm dragging my two kids, right? Because they are done. They are done going to fairs and festivals. They are done going to cook-offs. We didn't walk in the neighborhoods. We used the power of social media a lot, um, which was good. We didn't have to really f- fan out across the parish and knock on every door and, and, and shake every hand. Um, but they were just done, <laughs> right? And, and even at that point, you're done, right? It's just it's, – it's been so much. It's been – you know, almost 15 months of doing this. We've made fairs twice. We've made every cook-off. We've done town halls. We've done virtual town halls. We've done late nights. We've done early mornings. We've done fish fries, jambalaya cook-offs, whatever we could put our name on to get our name out there. Um, and it was just done. And then you win the election that night, and you wake up the next morning, and you go, geez, not now. <laughs> right? I caught the train. What am I going to do with it? Um, you you, you got to put together an administration. you got to figure out where the guy who's leaving left off Right? How much money do you have in a bank? What's what's in capital outlay in the state legislature? What's what are you going to do on day one? And and luckily because and, and we talked about this during the campaign, 
I had worked there before, right? So I knew where the literally knew where the office was, knew where the phone was, knew how to work my email. That was half the battle in in that world, right? Because a lot of people don't have that luxury. Um, so it was it was it was a stretch. And how do you find? You know, we had done some pre planning, or we if we're lucky enough to win this, hey, you, you, and you, do you want to come back and work here? Um, how do you pick? How do you pick a parish administrator, right? The guy who's the number two that if I die tonight has to wake up tomorrow morning and put his hand on a Bible and say, yep. I'm going to defend the Constitution and, 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 and say the words. How do you do all of that? It was tough. Well, let's let's kind of shift gears a little bit and talk. You know, we were joking uh, at the beginning about the high school rivalries, and but it's real. Uh, it, it's something to really talk about, but it's not just high schools, right? I mean, and especially now after a couple of years in being in this office, you've seen it. I mean, that rivalry or that contention maybe between the, the North, Central, and South areas of Lafourche is real. Um, and to, to the extent we see it in the communities, we also see it in politics, obviously. One of the things you ran on and you still to this day uh, talk about is unifying the parish and kind of getting rid uh, of, of that mentality of dividing the parish into thirds. Why is that so important to you? You know, look, I, I literally drove from a, a meeting with Congressman Scalise to come here, uh, and, and he had a group of people in town talking about the oil and gas industry. He does that every year. He brings representatives from other parts of the country here to, to look at the oil and gas industry and how we do it. Um, and and we, you, you sit back and you talk about how great Lafouche is, right? You talk about how we have one of the top three school districts in the state. We talk about our great health care network. Uh, even though Lady of the Sea got pounded by Hurricane Ida, they're still pumping out you know, quality health care in, 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 in the Bayou region. You, you talk about all the great things that we have from an industrial aspect. But then you talk about, okay, so South Lafourche is all in gas. Central Lafourche is agriculture and some light manufacturing, and Thibodeau is your re- retail hub. But to make this parish work as one, you got it all. You got to put it all together. Because if we, if, we if we keep going down that road, then we're never going to make anywhere. And, and, and we were joking before the podcast, and, and now's a perfect time to talk about it. You know, we, there was a big flutter of, of social media activity about recreational opportunities for our kids, right? And, and I made the comment on Facebook that in, until we unite this parish, it's hard to make meaningful investments in not only recreation, but anything, because you can't always build three of something. We can build one really cool thing. And, and even though we, we will travel the country and we will travel the world to go see cool things, we can't drive from Galliana to Raceland or from Thibodeau to Raceland to have that one great thing. Uh, and, and I think as we, as, we, as we look toward the future, we're, we're going to make some positive improvements to, to, to how to do that. And I think it, it starts not only from a personal perspective, and, and the council we have today um, I think is starting to get that. Uh, even even my buddy Councilman Lorraine gets that, right? As as much as he, he's sturgently <laughs> defending South Lafouche, and he always will to his, to his, to his testament, uh, even he is starting to see that South Lafouche needs Thibodeau just as much as Thibodeau needs South Lafouche, right? If, if we don't have the, the captain on the boat driving the, the widget out of Fouchon onto the rig, then he can't go to the new Burks Outlet in Thibodeau and buy his wife a nice shirt for, his, for her anniversary, right? We are, we are one in the same, and, 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 and Hurricane Ida, and I think COVID really proved that, that this community rallies together like no other. And it didn't matter when you got that plate lunch after Hurricane Ida because you were living in a, in, a, in a car for a couple of days, that it came from Thibodeau Regional Health Systems instead of Lady to Sea. It didn't matter if it came from Nog Joe from uh, Menard Street instead of Nong Joe from West 123rd. That's what we need to focus on. I think, uh, you know, I think everything has its place, and, and certainly things like, obviously, like schools. Yeah, sure, you, you need to have a local one. But to your point, um, you know, it, it's tough because you're fighting decades and decades of, of, you know, recreation, a good example. Everybody's used to one thing. So it, it is an uphill battle because you have to convince all these people that the way you've been doing it for all these years – if we want something better, we're going to have to change it. And, man, people people love better, but they don't necessarily like change. Uh, and there's always going to be uh, some major thing that we can look toward to, you know, that, that we can maybe build better in a certain area. And, of course, you know, it has to be that decision where it's going to be. And you want something to be centrally located uh, but uh, and accessible to everybody and centrally located. But you can't overload the central area either. And I think that's the thing people are really going to have to think about in the years to come is, you know, um, will if we want better, 
can, are we willing to work for it? Are, are we willing to drive a little bit for it? I mean, you, you made, you make a good point with travel ball, you know, people, people want that better experience. They want something better for their kids. So they're willing to travel for it. So how much is everyone willing to do that? I think is the, the question. Um, let's, let's shift gears and talk about COVID. Um, and we won't, we won't spend a ton of time on this cause I think you and I especially, but <laughs> maybe everybody listening is, is pretty done with it, but uh, we would be remiss if we didn't at least uh, spend one segment on it. Now that we're at the, our lowest levels of COVID influence in our lives since the start of the pandemic, I always tell people the toughest part of COVID from my point of view and my job, my profession, was the outright rejection of facts and science um, and people making health decisions based on politics. From what I do, I was not prepared to deal with that. I, that was never something I had considered could happen. Uh, how do you convince people to do the right thing uh, when they are not even accepting science and, and facts and what's being said? But there was a reason for that, right? I mean, there was miscommunication and mishandling from the top and from really so many facets of this. So we have to point out from parish government standpoint, um, you had to make some really tough decisions. And I'm sure that you made a lot of people mad uh, in the process. Talk about your experience with COVID, especially going back to the beginning uh, when we had these, you know, federal and state mandates that tied your hands but left some wiggle room for you, and then you were forced into making decisions. Yeah, you know, I, I remember when we first took office, we made a, a one of the first few weeks we were there. It was Washington Mardi Gras, uh, and and for those who don't know what Washington Mardi Gras is, it's you know, we, we take the, the, the Hilton on Constitution Avenue in downtown D.C. and we turn it into a 65th parish. Everybody from Louisiana goes up there. It, it's The daytimes are spent in meetings with our congressional delegation, with staffers trying to get more funding, and, and the nighttime are, you know, is, is, is a lot of parties and social networking. Uh, and I remember flying back home, and, and you started to see people wearing masks on planes. And I'm like, what, what the heck is up with this? And COVID was a kind of a thing out in Europe, and we're like – yeah, this is going to be like H1N1 back in the day or Ebola. It's never going to hit the body. We're never, you know, it's people are stupid for wearing masks, right? Um, back then. And I, and I never forget that first COVID case hit New Orleans and we're starting to go, all right, what do we do, right? So we, we, we literally walked up to the bookshelf and pulled the pandemic plan that every parish has off the shelf. Chris and Eric and I dusted off and we go, okay, we, we got these pod sites set up. If we got to give people pills or shots, we practice every year with flu shots. We got this. And then the call hits about three weeks after that, that we have the first case in Lafourche. And, and the proverbial crap hit the fan, right? Because everybody starts to freak out. Oh, my God, it's in Lafourche. Who is the person? Where does he live? Has he touched me? Has he coughed on me? You know, and, and you try to start to figure out how to deal with that panic, um, and, and you don't know. And, and I, I said that in the beginning. Nobody thought 75 or 74 days in to administration we'd have to deal with something that was not tangible. It wasn't a hurricane. Um, it wasn't. An ice storm, even though we've had a few of those, they aren't common. But you know how to deal with that, right? You, you, you tell a Cajun a, a hurricane's coming. He goes to the, to, to the Tobacco Plus. He buys a case of beer. You have a hurricane party. You, you shut the shutters. You live it out. You eat Vienna sausage for a couple of days, and you move on with life. You tell a Cajun a snowstorm's coming. We got wrecks all over the highways, right, because they don't know how to drive when roads are slick. You tell a Cajun there's a pandemic coming, we, we got no clue, right? Because you can't VA at that point anymore, right? Um, so it was, it was, it was tough. Um, and I remember as it, as it started to progress, as things started to get locked down, you know, we start to shut businesses down. We, start to, we shut schools down. Um, we shut you know, different facets of our life down. And then we go, okay, so this is going to work. And then the case, is, the case count keeps rising. So then everybody begins to look at you. Like, how are you going to fix this? And I, and I like to use the analogy in the height of COVID, I had a third of the parish that wanted me to lock everything down and keep everybody in their house. I had a third of the parish who wanted me to just let it loose. Didn't matter. We're going to do, we're going to live life. And I had a third of the people who just didn't care either way. Right. And I remember we were, we used to have these, these weekly conference calls with uh, the governor's office, with the department of health about what was happening. Uh, and then we would have kind of a parish leadership call. I had the state, you know, our state delegation, you know, the sheriff of the DA, the judges, uh, the assessor, the clerk, our council, fire chiefs, everybody, everybody on this call. And one day I was just super aggravated with it all, right? You know, case counts continue to rise. It was right after we lost Reggie. Um, you know, we're, we're getting calls from people who are really concerned about, 
you know, people just hoarding toilet paper and all the weird stories we heard about people overrunning Walmart. Um, we had people at like the big box stores like the Lowe's and Thibodeau that were raiding the garden center and everybody was concerned that everybody was in the garden center. And I made the comment on that conference call. I said, you know what, guys, this is what we're going to do. You know, the, the, the governor's executive order, I, I can't do anything less than that by law, but I can, I can strict the hell out of it, right? So I said, we're going to shut it all down. If it's not levy construction or if it's not something critical, if you're not a nurse that has to drive to a hospital, we're just going to lock it all down. And it was a it was a spur of the moment, you know, kind of hindsight being 2020. Never should have said on a conference call. Well, I didn't know it at the time, but somebody had like leaked out that conference call number. And there were people on that call that shouldn't have been. So that all that night, I'm getting like these weird text messages from business owners going, you're going to kill us. You know, we're holding a press conference tomorrow. We're going to call you out. You can't do this. So you make some phone calls to the people you trust um, and people you know you can talk to, and, and you kind of walk that back, right? Because, again, it was a gut shot. Um, you know, you, you got to step back and go, yeah, shutting down every business in Lafouche Parish, probably not the best way to handle this, right? And as, you, as we get out, as we got further into the pandemic and you get some of the science behind it, you get away from those political motives, you get away from the, the political ramblings of people in state and federal government, you realize there were ways to do this. Um, and, I, and I think looking back, God forbid, if we ever have to do this again, I, I think I personally learned a lot through that and how we would do this over again. Um, but I think the science has us a lot farther now where, where we know that. And then, you know, it was, it was the trunch that, you know, if you, if you put on a mask, you know, you got called one thing because somebody didn't like masks. If, you know, I, I got invited to the white house around Christmas of 20, 2020, uh, when Operation Warp Speed kind of came out with President Trump, and it was 50 local officials from across the country. There was only one from each state, and somehow they picked me. I don't, I don't quite know how it worked yet. Um, but you, you got to hear from the people who developed the vaccine. And I know there are still anti-vaxxers out there, people who are even going to listen to this. But when you get to look the guy in the eye who developed the vaccine, he could care less whether you're on the left side of the aisle or the right side of the aisle, whether you were Catholic, Baptist, Muslim, Buddhist, whether you were black, white, brown, purple, yellow. Um, you know, when you he did it because he wanted to save the world, right? You get that comforting feeling about it. But then when you come back home and you start to talk about it, you get slammed by the anti-vaxxer group or you get slammed by that group. So there's – in a situation like that, there is absolutely no winning. So the only thing you do – is you figure, yep, yeah, this is this is what I think is best. This is what that core group of people that we talk to on a daily basis think is best, and you roll with it. And if I made some people mad at the end of the day, which I'm sure I did, then then oh well, right? We were doing what we thought we had to do to keep this parish alive. I, I will tell you that from my personal standpoint, um, I I was the middle of the road guy. Uh, I didn't, I, I wasn't, uh, you know, far left or right on any of the thinking. Um, I felt like I could think for myself and I could, um, I could not research myself because I'm not, I'm not one of those people that felt like I could, I could somehow Google the, and, and figure it out on my own. Uh, but I, I figured that I could, I could manage my own threats. Uh, I, I could, I could assess the threat to me and my family and figure out what to do. And honestly, uh, you're talking about, I'm glad you brought that up about being invited to the white house. The information you brought back. Um, and 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 the videos from Operation War Speed, that summit that you guys were at, is really what we used internally, um, and and what I shared with friends and family. Uh, a couple of clips, and it was no more than about ten minutes long, of those guys talking. And you know, it kind of dispelled all of the concerns that people had at the time. Of course, we've moved the goalposts, and now there's all kinds of new concerns. But on the vaccine, the initial vaccine, and one of the main ones being uh, how fast it was developed, that was my main hangup, to, to be honest. And hearing from those guys is what convinced me to get the vaccine. Um, and again, even to this day, you know, it's it's so easy to be like you have an anti-vax group and an anti-mask. Uh, you have a mask up group and a vax group. Well, it's not that simple. Like, I think most of the silent majority uh, was somewhere in the middle, and we're just assessing our own health, and I made decisions for it. Look, I'm as glad to be rid of all of the mask and everything as anyone else, uh, believe me. I'm, I'm pretty pumped up. We're flying out next week. 
um, to go do a business trip and I don't have to wear with a no mask, mask with no mask on a plane. <laughs> That's going to be awesome. Uh, yeah. And, and the beautiful thing is if you want to wear one, you can You'll wear one. And, right? and, and maybe we never have to talk about that again. That's so right. uh, we'll, we'll both put that to bed, Archie. Uh, let's move on though uh, to something that, man, uh, if we thought COVID was a problem <laughs> in 2020 and 2021. Uh, and look, you know, I, I remember joking with, with my friends at, at our national group, uh, about all the graphics I had to create in, in 2020 for all those hurricanes. Uh, I didn't have to create that many in 2021, but man, did we use it a lot. Uh, for and, and we're still, to this day, uh, I know you guys are using it as well uh, at Parish Government. Hurricane Ida, um, I, I, I've been looking, at, looking back at some of the videos uh, that, that the sheriff did, that you did uh, in, right before and right after. And uh, it's it was amazing. It was like I said, and when we started this, an unprecedented level of transparency, and we almost got a glimpse on how you were thinking and what you were thinking uh, day by day. Almost, you know, in some cases, hour by hour, as this thing was going, and you were very raw, especially that first video after Ida hit. I, I went watched that one a couple of times. You were very raw and real uh, on that video, and I think whoever had access to internet at the time i think watched that and said this this guy's one of us he's not you know he's not in an ivory tower somewhere he understands what happened and you know you gave me and i'm sure a lot of other citizens a sense of confidence after we experienced arguably one of the worst events of our lifetime yeah this is you know our parents always talked about betsy right this is going to be our generation's betsy and i will tell you that the Probably by far, and, and I hope this is the hardest thing I ever have to do in my life. Was was this hurricane? And um, you know, I can remember, and, and you know this well, Brendan. When, when when these storms come, you get in these battle rhythms. Um, you know, it, it they show the graph that you know it's coming in the Gulf, and then we start these conference calls with the governor's office of Homeland Security and with the National Weather Service. And that that Friday afternoon, we had kind of put some steps in place. We had been prepping. You know, we were doing sandbag operations. We were doing closing up gaps with the levee districts with Hesco baskets. Uh, inmates were filling sandbags for us. We were handing them out. And that Friday afternoon, uh, we had kind of had some plans for some evacuation orders. We had already called the evacuation for south of the floodgates, which was typical, right? You do that every time something happens. You know you're going to do that. Um, and in that battle rhythm, we, we always do a 10 o'clock call, and then we have a 4 o'clock call with the Weather Service. And at 3.30, you know, our EOC is set up with a big conference table and TVs everywhere. We're watching the news. We're watching uh, the computer models. Uh, and I'm and I'm sitting outside that table talking with Chris and some of our Homeland Security staff and and our other you know public work staff and uh, they come find me and, and the National Weather Service forecaster was on the phone, so we pick up the phone and she says, "Hey guys, look, we just want to let you know uh, the four o'clock advisory is fixing to come out and this thing's going to be a Category Four hurricane. Uh, five is not out of the realm of possibility, uh, and the track is dead set on you." And I and I remember going, "Okay," uh, and we, you know, we made it through that conference call um, and then literally walked out, um, told Chris to do a couple things, and I walked out into what we call the ballroom of our of our Matthews office. It's this big open space that we didn't finish with the renovations. There's a couple of chairs. And I sat on that chair, and I, and I put my head between my legs and just started bawling like a five-year-old schoolgirl. Um, and, and Robbie came out. Robbie Lee's our communications guy, came out, and he, he looked at me, and I looked up at him, and I'm, I'm just – my eyes are red and puffy. I'm crying. Um, and he goes, boss, you're right. And, and I looked back at him and just stutter mumbled – I don't know how we're going to keep people safe. And to Robbie's credit, he grabbed me and drug me in the back room so nobody else would see me cry. Um, and then went back and found a couple other folks, found Mitch and Dylan, and they, and they came found me. And I'm, and I'm, I'm pacing the floor because I, I don't know how you keep people safe from that, right? We've, we're calling these evacuation orders. I know the levy system is great. I, I know we have all these preparations in place, but we're about to get our butts kicked, right? And, and I don't know how to deal with that. Um, so the, the, the storm hits, you know, we called these evacuation orders. We got nursing homes out. We got as many people as we could to, to the shelters at the two high schools, which were rated for category four storms. Um, cause it was too late at that point to get people in Monroe, right? We knew the storm was coming Saturday night into Sunday morning, which wound up being more like Sunday into Monday. Um, but at that point we, we knew we were out of time. We wrote it out. You know, we hear air conditions flying off the, the roof of our building. We can see some of the camera footage from the port. We see how high the water's getting. We're, we're hearing sheriff's office deputies on the radio talk about what they're seeing. Uh, we're seeing videos because we still had some Internet connectivity at that point about what people are seeing out of their windows and, and what they're seeing as the eyes passing over. Uh, and then about 2 o'clock that Monday morning, when it died down enough, we got on the road. 
uh, and you start to see what it looks like, right? And I, and I made it from our office in Matthews to about a mile and a half past the Broadway in Lockport, the nursing home. And there were just trees and power lines, and there was no way we were going to get any further than that. Um, and and you just start to freak out because you don't know what your you know you, you don't know what your what your rest of your community looks like. And I will tell you, the most hopeless feeling I've ever had in my life was that Friday afternoon. I had, I went home and I told Ashley. I said, "You got to get the girls in the car, and y'all got to get out of here." Right? I can't leave, but you got to go to your grandparents' house in Texas. I don't know what you're going to come home to. I don't know if our house is going to be here but you got to get out, right? And I'm kissing my two little girls on the head as we're putting wedding albums in the car, and I'm crying again, and I'm, I'm, I'm getting them out, and I go back to the office. And, and the, the video Brennan talked about was, I think that Tuesday or Wednesday, the, the state fire marshal had brought a, um, a command unit in, and we were finally able to connect to some type of satellite internet connectivity. And I, and I did that raw Facebook video with me just holding the phone, just saying, guys, it sucks right now, right? We got no power. We got no water. I don't know any of that's coming back on. I know you want to come home and check on your stuff, but stay back. But I guarantee you we're going to put the place back together, right? And for the last eight months, that's what we've tried to do. And it's been slow, uh, just like the vast majority of the people in our community. We're fighting with insurance companies. We're fighting with FEMA. Um, but I will tell you that I've never been prouder of this community to see it rally together. The other elected officials who brought food in, the church groups who brought stuff in, the faith-based community from around the from around the state and around the country that that brought stuff in, was was just freaking awesome um, to see people do that and to see how we took care of ourselves, to see people taking a bath in the baya a week after the storm because we still didn't have water in certain places um, was just was just awe inspiring, um, and it's 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 what puts the fire in my belly to keep rebuilding this place, and I think is what. For, for us in this room and for a vast majority of the community, what's kept people here, why we haven't seen a huge population shift out like you saw after Katrina and, and Reed out in southwest Louisiana. Again, I go back to how cool this place is, right, because we, we got stuff back up and running so quick, because Jared got kids back in school so quick, uh, because we got critical infrastructure, Dirk and, uh, excuse me, Wayne and, and Jared at the water district got water back up because the energy rolled in, you know, in four weeks had our entire parish back up on power. Um, is, is why we haven't seen a lot of people leave and, and why a lot of people I think are going to stay long term, why people our age are all going to stay back here and continue to raise our families here. It's just been really cool to watch. I'm glad that you shared uh, kind of your moment. And it's interesting that it was brought on by something from uh, uh, someone at the National Weather Service said, because I have a similar story. Uh, I, like you, had you know I had to stay and, and I sent my family out. And they're on the road. On it, This was on the Saturday, the day before the storm hit. And like you, I'm very much going through the motions. You know, we've done this 100 times. Like, you know, yes, this is, is – and I think people don't understand that when you train, just like you practice football. Like, it doesn't matter how bad the opponent is. Like, you're up for it, and you may get up for it a little bit more, but you're doing the same things, and, and you're ready. I mean, this is, this is what you've been training for. But – uh, I remember very distinctly, I will never forget, the governor's press conference on Saturday afternoon. This is after uh, they had, you know, uh, had upgraded it to a four and, and possibly a five. And Benjamin Schott from the National Weather Service gets on right after the governor, um, right after Governor Edwards and says, this is going to be a life altering storm for all those in its path. And I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it. That moment uh changed everything for me uh and that was on the saturday afternoon i was locked in already uh but it made me realize personally what's at stake here like you i'm thinking okay my family's out of town when are they even going to be able to come back what are they coming back to is our house still going to be there uh and unfortunately for many people that answer was it wasn't um but uh, when you look at those moments, uh, I, I think everybody had that moment when you realized this is real. This is really happening. This is not something we're watching on the Weather Channel happening in Florida. This is happening right here in our backyard. Yeah, and I, and I think as much as we've trained for stuff like this and as much as we run these tabletop exercises every year, as much as we've been through with – you go all the way back to like Hurricane – you know, Tropical Storm Allison that flooded parts of Thibodeau. You think about Katrina, Rita, Gustav, and Ike, a Hurricane Barry in 2019 – um, we we train for the front end. We don't always train for what happens on the back end. We don't train for how do you deal with, 
you know, Miss Joyce, who you, you happen to be on the same street when she finally makes it home and her house is gone and she's got nothing else to do but cry on your shoulder and you're giving her a hug. You got no clue how to train for, you know, Miss Emard, who is on her seventh insurance adjuster and they threw everything away in her house, including her jewelry and her dead husband's pictures. You, you, you don't train for that. Right. And you, you have no idea how to deal with that. Um, but unfortunately now we do. And, and I think again, just like COVID, this storm opened up a bunch of holes for us because nobody would have ever thought we would have lost a water system. We'd have been without power for four weeks. We'd have had this much devastation, but now we know how to deal with that. We know how to cope with that. We know how to deal with the immediate aftermath and, you know, even today, eight months later, what that aftermath still looks like. And that's what that's what I was going to let, let's end the audit discussion on this note. Uh, one other thing we don't train for is what happens 10 months later, 12 months later, three years later, when you're still looking at blue tarps on roofs and still looking at businesses shut down or not reopened. So let, let's talk about where are we headed from here? I think everybody listening to this has a good idea. If you're a Lafouche Parish resident where we are, where are we headed from here, uh, especially from the standpoint of parish government? Yeah, you know, as, as, as much as a storm hurt us, I think it's going to give us a crucial opportunity, right? When you look at the amount of federal dollars that are about to roll into our parish, the, the stuff that we're going to be able to do with it, it's going to be huge. We're going to be able to take our drainage system that in a lot of cases hasn't been touched in 60 years and, and revamp it holistically. We're going to go from building pump stations that pumped a little bit of a little bit of water and, you know, never took into account hydraulic engineering. We're going to be able to do that now. We're going to be able to pump water faster and more efficiently. Um, you're going to see better infrastructure come in. You're going to see more money in levees that help protect us. You're going to see a bunch of money come in that, that's going to help strengthen our homes, right, if you have to rebuild and, and how you're going to rebuild that because of code compliance issues. Um, but I, I think from a, from a different level, looking outside of those federal dollars, you're going to see a renewed investment, at least from, from me right now, in our community. You know, even though we've had some, some budget constraints, you know, our assessor has done a great job with reassessing the parish and we have some loss in revenue because of that. But we're going to do more with that less, right? We're going to make some investments in recreational fields. We're going to start turfing fields in South Lafouche, which is something that nobody would have ever dreamed would have happened, right? right? We're going to have fields turfed in La Rosa and Gola Meadow, um, hopefully by the end of the year. And we're going to keep that going until we turf all of them. Um, you're going to see a renewed investment in, in, in economic development, which was another huge part of the campaign. Um, and how do we diversify our economy? Oil and gas is always going to be king, but there's this cool thing called offshore wind that's coming, right? We're going to have windmills off the coast of Lafouche Parish, and I think that's going to reinvigorate not only the service industries in South Lafouche, uh, but those engineering guys who know how to design these things and the lift boat captains who are going to have to help build these things. It's going to reinvigorate that. You know, we're seeing a huge housing boom in North Lafouche right now in Thibodeau. You know, we've, we just approved probably five new developments in Thibodeau that are 600 new lots. And, and what we're seeing is we're seeing that younger generation, those kids who are just coming out of college, first-time home buyers, are probably working a little bit in Lafouche, but they're working at the plant on the river. They're working in New Orleans. They're working in Baton Rouge. But they're coming back to Lafouche to live. They're bringing their tax dollars back home. They're bringing their families back home. Um, you're seeing that huge housing boom up there, which, again, leads us into in, in, in the creating that, that unity in the parish, right? And, and you're going to see some things from us later on this year where we're going to do some things that people have, have not wanted to touch in a, lot of, in a lot of years, and that's tax reform, right? How do we consolidate road districts and drainage districts to further make us one parish, right? Cool. We, can, we can lower your tax rate and generate more money, but South Lafouche has to be willing to trust me that I'm not going to send all the money to Thibodeau. And Thibodeau's got to trust me that we're not going to send all the money to South Lafouche. Or Central Lafouche has got to trust me that we're not going to split it in, and they're going to get nothing, right? And that's going to be a tough discussion. Um, but we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna work the streets. And um, as Andrew Shepard said in, in the, the American president, I'm going to go door to door if I have to. I'm not going to get you guns, but I'm going to get the tax reform, right? <laughs> um, my name is Archie Chesson. I am running for parish president, <laughs> um, to, to quote the end of the movie. But, um, you know, it's those things that I think the, the future is really bright when we look at finally having a cohesive group in government. And, and they call us the courthouse crew, but, you know, the sheriff, the DA, the clerk, the assessor, I lump in the school board superintendent into that, and I lump Chet into that from the Port Commission um, as those six major entities that make up make up Lafouche Parish, along with our three mayors. Um, and we finally have a cohesive group that can sit around a table, and even though I may think one of them around the table is a fun chalk, when we walk out the door, we're still friends, right? We're not. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna call you a fun chalk on national TV. Um, I promise. 
and, and we have that relationship and you have a, a, a good young group of people and a core leadership group that really care about the place we live, that it's, it's not politics anymore. It's about making it a cool place for our kids to grow up. I, uh, I'm glad you, you ended on that because that's a good segue. I forgot that we share a, a love of that movie in American President. So shout out to Michael Douglas and go watch that. I think it's from the 90s. Uh, and it's a great movie. Uh, but but since you brought up your kids, I, I did want to end on that personal note. Archie, uh, our daughters are friends and, and we've uh, run into each other on the birthday party circuit uh, at, at sporting events. Uh, you, you know, any of those things that uh, dancing, uh, any of those things that, that girl dads have to deal with. But um, I'm not a parish president. <laughs> how do you find the time is, is my main question. Uh, how do you balance that work and home life being still being able to be there, be a good husband and be a dad to those two young girls? Yeah. So, you know, I, my, my prayer at the end of every day, uh, is that God makes me the man I need to be for my wife, my kids and this community. Um, and, and I don't, I make a concerted effort to do it, but my wife makes sure I do it. Uh, we have a very strict three night of the week rule uh, that I try not to schedule more than three meetings. And um, although it always doesn't happen, I, I try to make it home before bedtime, right? So I can be there with them, um, watch Bluey or whatever it is they're watching that night uh, and, and tuck them into bed. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but it's, look, it, it's, it's funny. It's funnier now that they're getting older. Um, when we When we ran three years ago, almost four years ago, I guess, um, they were still kind of young. They didn't quite grasp what their dad was doing. Now they kind of do, right? They're learning about government in school. I, I, I go home this a couple one night this week, and um, our oldest daughter is in third grade, and they're starting to do kind of government stuff. And she goes, "Daddy, what laws do you enforce?" And I'm like, "Well, I do the civil laws. The sh- you know the, sh- the police do the criminal laws." And um, I said, "I'm more of the the we we kind of help make the laws sometimes, right?" And she, her, you can see it in her face. Her mind's running because she's like, wait, what's a civil law? What's a, you know, she's not quite that far yet. Um, but it's, they're starting to enjoy it. Um, it's fun to watch them interact with people uh, as you go to fairs and festivals or you go to Walmart and inevitably somebody's got a problem, you know, especially post storm. You know, where's my, I need a permit to redo my roof or my house or uh, I have a pothole or, um, you know, the, my, my favorite one as of late was, um, my neighbor's draining their pool and it's bleeding into my yard and causing a puddle. What do I do about that? Um, it's, it's, we run the gambit of questions in, in life. Um, but it's look at being, a, being parish president is really cool, but being a dad is just awesome. And, and I'm as much as I love our community and I tell this to people all the time, cause sometimes, well, where were you? Well, you know, we just got off the bitty basketball circuit and, and I was not going to miss a bitty basketball game, regardless of what else was going on. Um, just because my kids are that important to me. And, um, people, re- people, I think realize that and they respect that in most cases, um, that if you missed a cook off because your kid was playing ball, it's okay. Um, but at the end of the day, you still put in a full day of work. That's awesome. I, I love the three night rule. That's a, <laughs> that's, that's a pretty good one. Well, Archie, uh, we sincerely appreciate you spending some time and, and keeping us up to date uh, on what is going on. Uh, we had uh, the, the administration from Lady of the Sea General Hospital, and it was just awesome to hear about their experience of the storm and, and where we're headed. And, man, you just have to feel we – had, we had Chet on last season, Chet Chasson, and you just have to feel like you're listening to all this. And, and this is maybe some of the first times you're getting to hear all these people in long form uh, talk about things. And, and you have to be encouraged as a resident hearing all these people, uh, hearing guys like you come on, first of all, being willing to come on here, but, but secondly, uh, with that foresight in mind. Uh, you're not flying by the seat of your pants. Uh, there is a plan, and more often than not, it's it's far re- it's farther reaching than any anyone listening probably uh, even has a concept of. So uh, again, we appreciate you coming on, but we're not letting you go uh, without going through our rapid fire questions. Now, I hope you understand that your choices here may have consequences as your role as a parish president, but no pressure. All right. So let's start with what's your go to order at a down the bayou restaurant. Down the bayou, Archie. So, boudin egg rolls at Cherami's. Okay, I like it. Good choice. Uh, now, you've dropped a few, <laughs> probably more Cajun words than any other guest that we've had, but what's your favorite Cajun word or phrase and its meaning? Whew, that's a, that's a tough know. one. That's a tough one. See, so I'm a sport de la port, so, you know, I, I get a little bit of the, the, the northern Francais de Cajun and then down the bayou. Um, so school us on some uh, <laughs> some Yankee uh, Cajun. Some there. Yankee Cajun. No, my, my go-to is always is always Funchok. 
Um, it's just, it works so well and in so many instances. It does. It really does. Uh, what's your favorite snowball flavor? Ooh, tiger blood stuffed. Ooh, man, a stuffed. We had a tiger blood already, not a stuffed one. Um, next, well, this is a silly one. Next hurricane, staying or evacuating? <laughs> Gotta stay. <laughs> Please tell us you're staying. <laughs> All right, and this is the hottest topic, and this one could get you into trouble if you answer it wrong. So, uh, jambalaya or pastalaya? Jambalaya all day long. Okay. That was solid. He knew exactly what he wanted to answer there. All right, Archie. Well, thank you again so much for joining us. Uh, any any parting shots, any final words for no, us? Man, this, this has been an awesome experience. I'm glad I made the cut for the DTV podcast. <laughs> um, I was jealous of the last season that nobody called. But look, guys, just Lafouche is a great place to live. I'm humbled every day to wake up and lead the place. Put God first in life. He'll take you great places. We had to save some for season two, Archie. I understand. Uh, we appreciate it. But we thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. And that'll do it for this episode of the DTV Podcast. Uh, we want to thank our producer, Ross Jambon, our executive producers, Jure Gyro and Hillary Crum, and the rest of the Bless Your Heart nonprofit board members, Luke Newman and Chris Brantley. Be sure to follow and subscribe to the DTV Podcast on Facebook, Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also get more content by following us on Twitter and TikTok at the DTV Podcast. I'm Brennan Mathern. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time.